Felicia Cox, 9-7-2015 My aunt took Shane to school the next morning. Mom didn't want to tell him about Grandma until after he got home so she'd have some time to sleep and cope with her own emotions and figure out a tactful way to explain death to a five-year-old. She planned and replanned the speech she'd give her son over and over and still didn't have it down by the time her sister dropped Shane off at the house at 2.30. So she simply said what she felt, unsuccessfully holding back tears. Shane stared at her, empty-eyed, Oh, uh, okay, he said. Artie's outside. Um, can we play now? Mom lost it. Are you kidding me? She screamed. Grandma is gone, and you can seriously think about playing right now? <laughs> Shane frowned. He seemed to grasp that his mother was upset, but not quite understand why. His confused expression calmed her. He's processing, she remembered thinking. Fine, she said, more tempered. But today, tell Artie I'm driving him home and having a talk with his mother. He's over here just a bit too much, and I'm not sure he's a good influence on you. We're going to talk seriously about some time apart. Shane didn't react. If his mother threatening to take his friend away affected him emotionally at all, he didn't show it. If anything, the look he gave her was one of pity, not devastation. Not anger, just boring, inconvenient pity. The pity inspired by a homeless man begging for change. Wordlessly, he went back to the back door and let Artie in. Then, single file like soldiers, the little boys strode into Shane's room and closed the door. Mom sat down on the sofa to cry. But finally, the physical and emotional turmoil of the last 24 hours ran her down like a train, and she was too tired to squeeze out tears. So she leaned back and closed her eyes for a minute, for another minute, for... Her eyes snapped open. The room was dark. She looked at the clock on the VCR. It was past six. She'd have been asleep for nearly three hours. Something had woken her, a, a crash or a thud, some noise from a short distance away. Was it the boys? She went to Shane's door and turned the knob, cracking it slightly. She could see Shane sitting cross-legged on his bed, angled away from her. He was talking in a low voice to someone sitting on the other end of the bed, out of her line of sight. She opened the door a little wider, revealing a blue-clad knee. The child giggled. It was Artie. Of course. Who else? She whirled around. There it was again, and it definitely wasn't being caused by the boys. It seemed to be coming from the direction of the laundry room. She turned around. She heard Shane's door click shut. Jim? She called out, though she knew it couldn't be my dad. He had left for the airport around midnight the night before. She was getting scared. She considered calling 911, but didn't think loud noises would be enough to justify police involvement. Instead, she checked the front door and then the back. Both were locked. There was only one door to the basement and no external entrance, so if anyone was down there, they would have had to have snuck past her as she slept on the couch. The floorboards creaked. She'd often been awoken in the middle of the night by Jim or Shane getting a glass of water from the kitchen. She tiptoed to the laundry room door. She took a deep breath, turned the doorknob, and switched on the light. The room was exactly how she had left it. A basket of her scrubs and Shane's and Jim's jeans on the floor by the washer. A detergent bottle on top of the dryer with the lid unscrewed. She looked down at the trap door that led to the basement. It was closed, and the latch was set. The latch was set. The trap door had been locked from the outside. Mom felt a wave of panic, turned to run, and then caught herself. Even if an intruder had managed to sneak past her as she dozed on the couch, he couldn't possibly have gone down into the basement and latched the door behind himself, so it was probably just rats. Rolling her eyes at her own baseless fear, she unlatched the door and lowered herself down. When she had both feet on the landing that divided the stairs, she pulled the cord that turned on the light. A dim, piss-yellow glow illuminated the messy cellar. Artie stood at the foot of the stairs. Mom cried out and stumbled, managing to catch herself on the railing. 
Artie's blue eyes glowed. His iridescent skin seemed to possess its own luminosity. He stared at her, little chest rising and falling in ragged heaves, small fists balled as though grasping at existence itself, mouth open, soundlessly begging, fat tears rolling down blushed cheeks. Artie, sw- sweetie, how did, how did you... She stammered, her voice high-pitched and quavering. Mom's voice caught in her throat. Artie's face changed. He calmed, straightened, squared his child's jaw. He smiled, the biggest smile she'd ever seen on a little boy. A first day of summer smile. A Christmas morning smile. Except there was nothing angelic about this smile. There was only madness in his eyes. An insanity eons removed from his tiny body, from my mother's early naivety, from any human mind with human experiences. Then my mom came to a realization that made her legs weaken and her stomach drop. If Artie was down here, then who was with Shane? Mom ran up the stairs, through the open trap door, out of the laundry room to the bedroom of her child. She threw open the door. The room was empty. Everything was exactly as it had been before Shane came home from school. The only thing that indicated recent occupation were two small, child-sized indents in the comforter. She opened every closet and peered under the bed. She jacked the window that overlooked the backyard and screamed her son's name. Then, trembling and drenched in sweat, she stumbled back to the laundry room. This was a joke. She was seeing things. The boys were playing a trick on her. The basement door was still wide open and the light was on. She threw herself into the rectangular aperture and whirled around on the landing. Artie was gone. She ran down the steps to the concrete floor. Her foot landed on something small and hard, and she nearly fell headlong. The small wooden cube ricocheted off a molding cardboard box. One of Shane's blocks. She knelt down to examine the thing. It was the U. Unicorn. Umbrella. Unicycle. Unibrow. There were more blocks, all scattered around. They may have spelled something before she tripped over them. Seven of them in total. E. I. O. N. M. W. U. Like a child playing with Scrabble tiles. My mom sat cross-legged on the floor and stared at the letters. N. O. W. E. I. N. U. N. Now. You. Me. I. One. M. E. I. U. 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 N. E. M W I O Nothing. In frustration, she picked up two blocks, the U and M, and threw them at the ground. They bounced and clattered in opposite directions. Near tears, she rolled onto her stomach and crawled to retrieve them. And then she noticed something. The U had landed upside down, like a lowercase N. The set of blocks had only one of each letter. Shane or Artie or she shuddered had turned it over and used it as a second N. Shaking like a scared animal, she lined up the blocks and started over. She figured it out in a second. Mine now. She screamed, calling Shane's name over and over. She destroyed the basement, throwing boxes aside, knocking over furniture, scouring every inch of the space. When that failed to uncover anything, she tore apart the rest of the house. She opened every door, looked under every piece of furniture, ran out the back door and made two rotations around the property, crying out for her child into the darkness. Finally, she called the police. They sent a patrol car over and she told them everything. The cops were sympathetic and understanding, and within an hour, five more cars were casing the area for any sign of the boys. They'd find her son, they told her. Two little kids couldn't have gone that far. When she admitted she'd never once met Artie's mother, the cops seemed surprised, but assured her that they'd check out the unkempt white house that he'd once disappeared into. The officers offered Mom a ride to her mother's house in Edison to stay with her sister. She could rest for the night and then come into the station to answer questions in the morning. In the meantime, they'd continue searching the streets and keep patrol cars outside the house in case Shane returned. He definitely would, they told her. 
He and his little friend probably had some fantasy of running away to Sesame Street and would come back as soon as they got hungry or scared of the dark. The next morning, my father, who had been rushed back to Newark, arrived at the house. Two sheriff's vehicles were still there, one on either side. The cops assigned to keep watch told him that if he needed anything, grab it now because in less than an hour his home would be an active crime scene. He never came out. The cops didn't hear him scream. My mom was sitting in an interrogation room with the sketch artist when she was arrested. The artist had finished a drawing of Artie. It was quite good, but there was something missing. His eyes weren't quite right, and she found that she could not describe his smile. That desperate, crazed smile. They cuffed her right there at the table. Bonnie Ibanez, you are under arrest for the murder of Shane Ibanez. The next few hours were a blur. She was booked, fingerprinted, photographed, all while sobbing and screaming and begging for someone to tell her what was going on. Finally, she ended up back in that same interrogation room. This time with her hands cuffed behind her back across from a stern-looking detective. He demanded. She cried. He yelled. She, through his threats and derisive insults, pieced together what had happened to her only child. James Ibanez, her husband, returned home at approximately 10.30 a.m. The sheriff stationed there, after checking his ID, allowed him 15 minutes to take what he needed from the house. 30 minutes later, they went in after him. The door to the laundry room was open, the basement door was open, and the basement light was on. Jim was on the couch, blood pooled at his feet around a sharp kitchen knife. He'd slit his own wrists. He was dead. The cops, after they'd called the paramedics and radioed for backup, had a look around. In the family's basement, half covered by a patchwork quilt in his old crib, they found the stiff, ice-cold body of Shane Ibanez. Ten fingers, ten toes, no cuts, no broken bones, no signs of struggle or trauma at all, except for the clean, precise cut that had severed his head. They never found his head. Time of death was estimated at approximately 6.30 p.m. the night before. The last person to see him alive, besides Mom, was the boy's aunt, who dropped him off at the house at around 3. It had just been Bonnie and Shane, she said. But, my mom stammered, there's no way. I looked everywhere for him. You guys were at the house yesterday. He wasn't there. Maybe, the cop had said. But we weren't looking around that carefully, were we? Hardy. She whispered. The cop laughed mirthlessly. You keep on saying that, he mocked. Yet we have no proof this already ever existed. But the house, Mom said. I, I saw him going in, into that, that little white house that I showed you. You mean the house occupied by Miss Myrtle Anderson? Widow, 75 years old, lives alone, doesn't drive, no grandchildren in the state, never had a child or seen a child matching your description. But he... Two nights ago, you told us. She was watching TV in her room at that time, says no one went in or out. In fact, the cop continued icily, none of your neighbors seem to know this kid. According to our records, no one named Artie or Arthur or any other name that might be shortened to Artie under the age of 40 lives within five miles of your neighborhood. People saw him! My mom insisted. My mother babysat them all the time, and my husband, he, he met them. Both of whom, he sneered, are conveniently dead. Days went by. The sketch artist's drawing of Artie was on every nighttime news show, broadcasts all around New Jersey, up and down the eastern seaboard, and then nationwide. Neither hide nor hair of him was ever found. My aunts, my father's parents in Hudson City claimed that they'd heard Shane talking about a child named Artie, but that he'd described him like uh, an imaginary friend. You know, The cops determined he was a figment of the little boy's imagination, capitalized on by mom to cover up his murder. My two aunts put their dead mother's house up as collateral to get my mom out on bail. She holed up in her high school bedroom, sleeping with the light on and the door open, and trying to piece together how her son's decapitated body had magically appeared in her basement. Had some murderous sociopath kidnapped her child, strangled him right outside the window, and then returned his maimed remains as soon as she'd left? No, that was impossible. 
There had been cops around all night, and no one had gone in or out. And besides, she had seen Shane in his room, talking to Artie. But it wasn't Artie, because Artie was in the basement. Who had Shane been talking to? And how had Artie teleported into the basement, bypassing the latch? Why hadn't anyone but her and her late husband and mother and son seen the kid? Those clothes he always wore? Never stained, never wrinkled. The invisible mother, that house he disappeared into, and the message and the blocks. The blocks. She'd taken photographs of the two boys playing with the blocks. She hurriedly took the film to be developed, thanking God she'd kept the used roll in her camera bag, and her camera bag in the car instead of her house, which was now under the control of the police. She paid extra at Savon to have it done in an hour, an hour that she spent wandering aimlessly around the outdoor shopping center. She could prove it, she thought. Prove that Artie was real. Prove that she wasn't crazy. And when the process was done and she had the envelope of photographs in her hands, she waited until she was at her mother's house in her bedroom before opening her little package of salvation. They found her eight hours later, curled up in a ball in the backyard, self-inflicted claw marks up and down her arms, a Bic lighter and a pile of ashes at her feet. Mom told me she doesn't remember a whole lot of the next six weeks. She was confined to a padded cell in a psychiatric ward, mumbling and giggling. They'd had to place boxing gloves on her hands to keep her from hurting herself. She started improving around week three, remembering her name, and then her sister's and husband's and son's names, and then finally that her husband and son were both dead. She never told anyone what she'd seen in the photos that she burned. Upon her release from the psych hospital, my mom found herself a free woman in more ways than one. The police had dropped all charges against her due to two extremely puzzling circumstances. Circumstance number one, Shane's body disappeared. One day it was under a tarp in the refrigerator in the coroner's lab and then the next, it was gone. In its place was a small pile of gray dust. Neither the cops nor the coroner's office could come up with a reasonable explanation. Only three people had ID cards that would open the door to the lab. All three were accounted for, and the scanner had not recorded any attempts to access the room, successful or unsuccessful. And security footage showed that no one had been anywhere near the lab the night that it had happened. Circumstance number two, her house burned down. Six weeks earlier, the two sheriffs tasked with guarding the crime scene smelled smoke. The basement was burning. The flames moved unnaturally fast, soon engulfing the entire house. The cause of the fire could not be determined, but both arson and electrical failure were ruled out. Luckily, the fire didn't spread. It was a miracle the houses on either side hadn't gone up, the fire chief said. With no body, no motive, a questionable timeline, and any potential evidence up in smoke, the police could do nothing but free my mom and hide the case away as an unsolved mystery or an act of God. Of course, this didn't mean she was off the hook. The cops, fearing mass panic, had kept the more inexplicable elements of the incident from the public, including the missing body. So, mom was crucified by the press. My father's family wanted nothing to do with her. Her own sisters swore they believed her, and yet they insisted to sell their mother's house as soon as possible. And when it was sold way below market price, they split the money three ways. And then, almost immediately, both sisters left the state and changed their numbers. Mom hadn't spoken to either of them since. She couldn't stay in Rawway. Even if she hadn't been attracting dirty looks and furtive whispers, if not open hostility, every time she set foot outside her dingy hotel room, the town held nothing for her. Everybody she would cared about was gone. She saw her murdered child's face whenever she closed her eyes in the sight of his favorite McDonald's or the park where he'd played as a toddler just served to twist the knife in her heart. She slept a lot lost herself in trashy soap operas, never turning off the lamp on her bedside table. Beside the lamp, she'd set a bottle of sleeping pills. She'd stare at that bottle as she lay down to sleep, and when she woke up, sometimes in the middle of the day, and sometimes for what seemed like hours, wishing that she could just empty it with a glass of water and lose the ability to remember. But she couldn't. When she'd returned to her senses in the psychiatric hospital, the doctor had refused her Tylenol for her drilling headache because she was eight weeks pregnant. Eventually, she pulled it together, 
packed up her car, and drove to Ohio. She paid a man for a fake passport and driver's license under the name Elizabeth Johnson. She found a small apartment for rent, invested the money from the sale of her mother's home into starting a photography business, and then I was born. And then we moved to the little house outside Cleveland. But mom, I asked her, what was wrong with those photographs? The ones you burned? Why didn't you show them to the cops and prove Artie was real? At that, she sighed and closed her eyes. Her crow's feet darkened as the color drained from her face. She looked helpless, like an old woman and a scared little girl at the same time. Artie wasn't in the photographs, she said. The bedroom was there. The blocks were there. Shane was there, but um, the thing... The thing that was sitting beside him... Um, it wasn't Artie. It, um, it wasn't even human. It was an abomination that shouldn't exist. Humanity couldn't... I, I couldn't show anyone. I couldn't... I couldn't... She turned away to wipe her nose, tears running down her face. I couldn't get any more out of her. Either she thought the description of the thing she'd known as Artie would terrify me, or she couldn't find the words to describe it. I never brought it up again. She didn't let me out of her sight for weeks, and I slept in her bed for two months, terrified now that I knew what she feared. But the thing didn't find us in La Puente. I never saw the dark-haired little girl in the polka dot frock, or the blue-eyed teenager who couldn't feel cold ever again. My mom died when I was 22. Breast cancer. They caught it late. The cancer had spread, and the chemo didn't work. I moved all of her stuff into storage the day after her funeral. Um, I sat on the floor of my storage unit, surrounded by all of her memories, and looked through her photographs. There was hundreds of them. I mean, maybe thousands. I rented an apartment, found a job, passed the CPA exam, and four years later I fell in love with Isaiah Cox, who worked around the hall at an advertising firm. Two years after that, we married and bought a beautiful house in Glendale, and last February, I became pregnant with our first child. I'm due next month. It's going to be a little boy. I've never told my husband about my mother's story, or Shane, or the shape-shifting thing that stalks my family. Things? Maybe there's more than one of them. I'm debating it now, since we're about to be parents, but honestly, I don't even know how I'd go about it. Isaiah's not superstitious. He'd probably just assume my mother killed Shane and assure me that homicidal impulses aren't genetic. But there's a reason I'm writing this now. Why I'm putting it out there for strangers to piece through. Hopefully strangers who can give me the explanation I'm desperate for. It's because that thing that took my brother drove my father to suicide, tormented my mother, and posed as Katie and Zoe to ensnare me. It's still here. Two nights ago, I came home around nine. Isaiah was out. As I reached for the light switch, I nearly tripped over something small and hard. Flipping on the light, I saw the unexpected obstacle. Blocks. I knelt down. Alphabet blocks. The sort that children play with. The one nearest to me was a B. Beautifully carved and finished. On four faces were detailed pictures. Bananas, a butterfly, flowers, and a little dog? A beagle? Holding my breath, I gathered the blocks together. There were eight of them. N, I, U, B, M, A, J, E. All with beautiful pictures, obviously part of a set. Painted blue, red, green, or yellow. Definitely not ours. Thanks to my mom's story, I figured it out in seconds. Benjamin. Benjamin. The name that we'd chosen for our son. We hadn't told anyone yet, not even my in-laws. Heart pounding, I fled, locking the door behind me and locking myself in my car. I sat there for a while, hyperventilating, racking my brain for a logical explanation. Maybe it was a present from my husband. Um, a surprise. But those blocks, they were exactly like the blocks my mom had described to me. Irreplaceable, one of a kind, destroyed in a fire 30 years ago. My phone rang. I didn't recognize the number. I answered, my voice shaking. It was uh, Sergio from Rent-A-Box Storage. My storage unit, where I kept all my mom's old belongings, had inexplicably caught on fire. Everything had been ruined. 
Hands drenched, shaking like a leaf, I drove to the facility. A huge fire truck was parked outside, but the building still stood. According to Sergio, a short, balding security guard, the fire had been limited to my unit. The center block dividing walls had done their duty, apparently. Confused and terrified, I asked to see the unit. All my mother's photos, her photos of me growing up, had been destroyed. I stared into the charred black room, holding back tears, and then in the far left corner I saw it. A small sheet of thick paper. Huh? Sergio muttered. I wasn't there ten minutes ago. I picked up the odd little object. It was a photograph. Relatively old, judging by the quality, and burned around the edges. I got the impression I was only looking at half of the photo. The other half had been reduced to ash. It was of a little boy playing with blocks. Blocks identical to the ones scattered on my living room floor. Blocks that, when I returned home hours later, had mysteriously disappeared, though the doors were locked and the rest of the house was untouched. The boy was about six years old, dressed in high-waist shorts and the sort of t-shirt popular in the early 80s. His mop of curls, coffee-colored skin, square jaw, and large, deep-set eyes bore an uncanny resemblance to the photos of me at the same age. He was smiling. Laughing, looking to his right at another person depicted in the burned-out portion of the picture. An undecipherable shadow fell across him. I stared at the photo for a long moment. I knew the little boy was Shane, and I knew the unseen entity next to him was the creature who'd posed as Artie. What I couldn't understand was how the photo had ended up here, as my mother had burned it to ashes thirty years ago, after whatever cast that shadow had driven her to insanity. The last detail I noticed before the photo crumbled into dust in my hands was that the blocks laid out in front of Shane spelled on a word, the numerical zero and the letters S, O, and N. Soon. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or watching tonight, or listening to tonight's podcast, because it's also a podcast on Spotify, or on Apple, or on Google, or anywhere else you can listen to the podcast. On a hot summer day, there's nothing better than a glass of iced tea. And thus far, you should check out my wife's tea shop, etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. You can get numerous different types of tea, including a Mr. Creepypasta tea, the dark and stormy night, which, if you ask, you can get the Mr. Creepypasta dabbing sticker on the front of it. And lastly, as always, I want to remind you guys, if you ever want to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And I really appreciate any time you guys can support the show, because honestly, I love you guys. <laughs> You're all awesome. So, but A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Haha ha, Saha, Ken Lenda Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Karen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Shadow Morningstar, Mad Marshtomp, Mr. Thud, Patrick Schoolmeister, Z Kearley, Wolfie Nums, Rafael Rodriguez, WR Axis, Prozac and Pancakes, Mike Bullock, Acid System, Lauren, Brian Arse, and Rumble Fox. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I appreciate you more than I can possibly say. So thank you guys, thank you all for listening, and sweet dreams. <laughs>